financial inclusion has reached another historical crossroads. The first came about 10 years ago, when microcredit became microfinance. What happened was researchers brought in techniques from behavioral science to evaluate the impact that microcredit was having on poverty. And what they found was the mainstream belief that small loans were being invested in small businesses, which grew and then were able to repay those loans, was not happening on average. And in general, low-income people were using this money to fix their leaky roofs, to pay for unforeseen expenses like health bills, and to manage their short-term liquidity. This led practitioners in the field to really push an innovative array of financial services known as microfinance. The issue, though, is credit is a pull product, where other products like savings and insurance are push products. Uh, they are more expensive to roll out, and they don't generate near to the same amounts of revenue as microcredit. Therefore, the shift in the focus was to providing low-cost, affordable access to these products using innovative technologies, generally referred to as financial inclusion. And there's been some real notable success in this regard. We have biometric systems that have rolled out here in India and in Bolivia. We have card-based systems in Fiji and Brazil. And we have mobile phone-based systems made popular by M-Pesa in Kenya. There's now over 140 of them rolled out around the world, with 100 more in the pipeline ready to launch. So the issue du jour, the current crossroads at which financial inclusion finds itself, is that this increased access has not translated well into increased usage. Of the systems that have rolled out, very few have large subscribership, and those that have grown to scale with over a million users only really a few have active usage. Now what we need to understand is this is a very common problem referred to as the problem of the last mile. And there's examples of it around the world. In environmental protection we now have very affordable household size solar arrays with phone chargers but they're not being rolled out effectively. In public health we have antiretroviral drugs we have oral rehydration salts, but they're not being used ubiquitously. Here in India, wonderful work has been done to extend the reach of schools out to rural areas. But we have the problem where a lot of times the teachers don't show up to teach the classes. What we have here are technical solutions that haven't solved the human issue of the interaction with that solution. This is a behavioral issue. And often what we find with these products and services is they're really fighting an uphill battle. What they do is the clients uh, incur costs in the short ter term, yet the benefits accrue over a longer term. And there's some deep-seated behavioral issues that make this very difficult for humans to overcome. Now, not all this has been lost on financial inclusion practitioners. In fact, there's some great work that's being done in the field commitment savings devices to help people overcome their temptations, prize-based incentives to help bring some of these benefits forward in time. But what Microsave is really focusing on now is systematizing these opportunities because this is just a small subset of what's possible, of what we can do to increase active usage on these systems. We now have complex partnerships between mobile network operators, financial service providers, and agent managers. Incentives need to be aligned in these ecosystems. We now have the ability to communicate with customers anytime, anywhere. We need to give them better feedback to create intrinsic and extrinsic incentives that really push habitual use on these systems. Microsave right now is developing a methodology that will allow us to do this more systematically.